everyone to this International Women's Day World Bank Fertility Forum uh, broadcast. We are hosting today uh, Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, first female president of Liberia, Nobel Peace Laureate, and the first democratically elected president of an African nation. We're joined by three women from her outstanding Amuje initiative of the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Presidential Center for Women in Leadership. And I'm very proud as the founder of Global Women Leaders Strategic Philanthropy to host this session today. I want to start out by saying that this session has a focus on unapologetic action. And these words come from Madam herself. We're going to start off today with a keynote on the background on starting this initiative, why it's so important to invest in women, and importantly, in the center of the Fragility Forum, why women's equal participation is so key to bringing countries out of fragility and preventing fragility and violence. Madam, I will turn over to you first and foremost to start off with a keynote to set the scene for this important discussion with your amazing Amuje sisters. Madam, welcome. Thank you. The record is clear. More and more of the world's population are living in a fragile state. According to the World Bank, today 800 million people live in countries affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. By 2030, an estimated 46% of the world's poor will live in areas characterized as fragile or conflict affected. State fragility drives some of the biggest problems in our world today. Extreme poverty, mass migration, terrorism, trafficking, and even much more. Failing to address the challenges and risks that conflict affected and fragile settings face have critical implications both domestically and internationally. At the national level, failure to intervene effectively will perpetrate ongoing humanitarian crisis and might trigger new ones. For instance, conflict among warring factions could intensify, poverty could soar, refugee crisis could worsen. At the international level, as fragility worsens and expands, it is likely to carry a global ripple effect exemplified by a rise in international tourism, extremism, and conflict. Additionally, we will find intensification of migratory flows and refugee crisis, as well as disruption of trade routes, etc. There is no other way to say this. There is no denying the fact and there is no question that if we want to transition our nations out of fragility, if we want to ensure that our governments prioritize areas such as education, healthcare, and conflict resolution, if we want to positively impact the millions of people who live in abject poverty, we can no longer accept a culture of tokenism when it comes to women leadership. Continuing to exclude women from leadership positions in public service is tantamount to ensuring that we continue this perpetual cycle of poverty and fragility on our continent. Conversely, Strengthening the role of women as active participants in peace building and state building processes 
are likely to ensure peace, stability, development, and resilience when they are included in all society's endeavor and processes. We started the Amoja Initiative because of this, to unapologetically profile, prepare, and uplift women to position of leadership at the highest levels. Therefore, I am proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with those wonderful and accomplished women who sit on this panel today. They'll tell you their story, but we just applaud them for how they have stood up and what they do, and we look forward to a great future for them. A little bit about Amuje. Uh, it comes from one of uh, Liberia's dialects, and it means we are going up as they are. It has a mission that is predicated on the idea that if we want a more prosperous and equitable Africa, women's voices must not only be heard, but women must participate equally in leadership. When I started my leadership journey many decades ago, I dared to dream big, even when the odds of being a woman being named finance minister, let alone the president of an African nation, was almost unthinkable and insurmountable. I was ultimately elected as president by standing on the shoulders of women. Women, some of whom are uneducated and forced by society into a lesser place in life, but they dared to rightfully believe that a woman's place was not only in market stalls, or as facilitators, or in clinics, in hospitals, and schools, but also as mayors, governors, and yes, heads of state. Therefore, collective action is a wonderful force, not only for women in Africa, but for women across the globe, as we all endeavor to uplift, and empower the millions of those who will walk in our footsteps. Investing in women leaders as agents of change can come in many forms, but irrespective of the challenges that we will inevitably face, we must ensure that this happens. Whether it was, whether it's through financial contributions, advocacy and speaking out loud, whether it is through opening doors or even windows to lend a hand to someone, to pull someone up, do something, anything. For the collective power of our efforts, the shared determination of our goals, the audacity to believe that women's voices and thus our leadership is every bit as important as any man will propel us to a collective victory where everyone in the world wins. Let me close by saying, whatever success I have achieved in life, and for whatever progress that the women of the world have made in their call and fight for equality in leadership will mean very little if we fail in overcoming the systemic barriers to girls' and women's advancement while preparing future generation of ambitious, qualified, and I dare say, deserving women. 
I look forward to today's panel. More importantly, I'm excited as always to join all of you in this continued and just fight for women's leadership in our world. We live in difficult times right now. We, in, we are in solidarity with women who face domestic violence in our country, girls and young ones who raped. We're also in solidarity with the women and the children in Afghanistan. But we cannot refrain from saying, Happy International Women's Day. Break the bias. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you so much. Um, a few things resonate with me and why I was so thrilled to meet you and to profile the Abuja Initiative is that often you say that representation is meaningful in itself, but it's actually not enough and it's not the main game. To make meaningful progress on all of the policy initiatives and all of the development initiatives that we find so important as philanthropists, as, as donors, as a collective in the world, we actually need to have women at the table to make sure that we sustain and maintain progress on all of these things that are important to us in fragile contexts or not. Uh, while we have you here and before we turn to profiling the Emuje sisters, which I know is uh, so important to you and to me why we're here today. I just wanted to note also how we've spoken about how collective action is important, not only for you providing this collective platform for the Emuje women, but also collectively as women leaders around the world, I think that this is the very first place we need to invest. If we not aren't investing in getting women leaders to the table, to the highest levels of public leadership and civil society, then we are not making the gains that we'll need in one year, in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years. And so maybe just a few comments from you, Madam, while we have you on why we need female philanthropists, business leaders, and others to join this, uh, not just an advocacy platform, but an investment platform on investing in women and how going forward, um, that's something that we can all work on together to accelerate progress for all of our initiatives. Madam. Well, I do believe that uh, philanthropists that have already stood behind women uh, provide the understanding of why women want leadership. They go, because the nature of their work and operation is to ensure interaction, is to understand what women go through. And so the continuation of their work is so important because they, if you may say, the heart that they bring to their work makes a whole lot of difference. But yet, we still need others to join this fight, to join this necessary call to action to increase the women's participation and leadership. And we need investment. And that brings those from the corporate sector, those from the financial sector who bring to it a support of those women who just want the opportunity for self-reliance. They want to be able to have entities. They want to be able to be leaders first, of small entities, as we find many of them in small and medium-sized businesses, but we want to see them in corporate leadership also. Uh, we can take a situation where until now, less than 10% of the women hold the executive of a position in corporate bodies and corporate boards. And so our challenge and our charge is to continue to carry this message, the message of the importance of gender equity, the importance of women leadership, 
the importance of bringing to a world economy and national economies the contribution that come from women's involvement, women participation, women's leadership. It's time for change. And that change must raise all of the women of the world up to enable them to achieve their best potential out of their own energy. No woman is asking for favors. No woman is asking for giving them a position. Women are prepared to earn it competitively, deservedly, and unabashedly. So Kimberly, that's my answer. Thank you, madam. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to your amazing, these are only three of your Amuje sisters, the Amuje women. Uh, we had plans that we would love to have all of you on here. And I think we have plans that we've discussed going forward to profile many more of your sisters. But today, I'm so proud to introduce the women that you've gathered through your first two cohorts. I'll start by doing a quick introduction. And, and I'm going to ask you, because I think it's important for you to tell your own story, not me. Um, Tejo, I'll start with you. If you could please uh, just we'll do a quick round of introductions, introduce yourself um, when you joined the Muje Initiative and your current role. And we'll go to uh, uh, Dr. Yakima Jones next, and then Ole, you, Teju. So, I'm Teju Abisoye, the CEO, Executive Secretary at the Lagos State Employment Trust Fund, um, where our deliverable is how to improve employment opportunities for young people, making sure they get the right support, skills-wise, access to finance, basically making sure that livelihoods are properly improved in Lagos State, Nigeria, the largest city. Um, I was inaugurated into the Amuja Sisterhood in 2021. So I'm part of the second cohort. Um, and as we jokingly say, part of the second born group. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you, having me. No, it's uh, our pleasure. And I know you've just come off the back of a very large employment um, summit. So thank you for making the time. Um, Dr. Yaka Manti Jones, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Yakma Manti. Jones, I'm an Amuji sister from Sierra Leone. I'm the director of research and delivery in the Ministry of Finance in Sierra Leone. I'm a lecturer in economics in the University of Sierra Leone. I'm the founder of the Jones Foundation, working to bring back the reading culture to Sierra Leone, and also the CEO of PI Group, working in the light manufacturing and agribusiness sectors. So across my portfolio, I use um, policy, research, and entrepreneurship and philanthropy to drive change for women and girls in different spaces. And I'm also from the 2021 cohort and Tiji is my sister. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And Ole, we'll turn to you if you could please introduce yourself and a cohort you belong to. Thank you very much, um, Kimberly. Um, my name is Oli Dibawada. I am the founder and the president of the GAM Africa Institute for Leadership. I'm also the deputy senior administrative um, secretary for the United Democratic Party and um, formerly worked as the um, director for human capital, youth and skills development at the African Development Bank with the Forum for African Women Educationalist, and also currently working as a mentor coach um, to several young women and men um, across the continent and more so in the Gambia um, to help them really um, identify their personal and professional development depending on where they want to go. So in a nutshell, that's who I am, thank you. Thank you. Well, you're all amazing. And Madam, I, I do know you have to um, leave us in a few moments. So we thank you for your important staging and remarks, and most importantly, for starting this amazing initiative um, with these women. Before we um, uh, say goodbye, could you maybe just say a few things now that we've heard how amazing these women are, um, what the Emoji Initiative practically is bringing? I mean, these are women of a very high level uh, leadership positions already. What is the support and the hope that the uh, center brings uh, to supporting the cohorts that you've assembled so far? Uh, the center hopes to first work with these women in their strategies uh, as they prepare their joining. Uh, we would like to raise their profile 
so that what they are currently, the leadership they are currently holding will be known. Uh, we would like to see them reach out to each other and share the experiences among themselves so that each of them benefit from the experience of others. Would like for them to want to help them and work with them to have interaction with all of those women who have already advanced. Uh, many of them who sit on our board, those who hold really high international positions and get them to the place where they can best interact with those women. They can share their challenges and their difficulties on their journey. They can learn from these women how they can even enhance their own strategies to be able to overcome. And we want to make them courageous um, because there will be obstacles. And every now and then there will be a failure, one or two along the way. But we wanted to have that self-confidence that they have the potential to achieve their goal and will surmount any obstacle they face. The center is there to hold their backs, to be with them, to support them in all their endeavor, to even find others who can go beyond the capacity of the center, to also reach out to them and give them the support, whether it's technical advice, whether it's financial support, what is advisory work? What is advocacy? We do our part. We try to organize others that can enhance what we do. And we ensure that they themselves have a network where they are taking prime responsibility and they're achieving it out of their own efforts. Fantastic. Well, as, as you know, I feel the same way about the power of collectives, the power of not just your collective, but joining our collectives. And I, I look forward to working with you and the Amuje women to share our network, our community of women, to do all of those things to help lift these women up and accelerate progress, including the important investment. So Madam, thank you so much for framing this conversation today. And I know that you want to give um, time for the women to tell their stories. So we thank you so much for all that you're doing. And we look forward to investing in these women together because the power, it really is in the collective that you've formed, that, that we bring, and that we can broaden together um, across Africa and across the world. So thank you, Madam, so much for your comments. We, we wish you a very, very blessed International Women's Day. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Amoje leaders. I really would like to stay and hear everything that you have to say, but I do have a plane to catch uh, in a few hours. Uh, but I will be listening to the recording, so I will be able to hear it, and I'll be able to get back to you and be able to share with you my views on some of the exchanges that you will have. Goodbye to all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, madam. Safe travels. Thank you. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to um, ask you to, I guess, really take off from where we've left the conversation with Madam. And Tejo, I might start with you, really about uh, maybe the power of the collective from your perspective. You know, what is it about the collective power of women? What does that mean to you? And what are you getting out of this Amuje initiative um, beyond just, you know, a, there's a lot of mentorship programs. There's lots of things that women go through, leadership programs. What's special about the Amuje initiative? Um, and what does it bring to you, this collective of sisters, as you call each other? Okay, thank you very much, Kimberly. Um, I think um, what I would say very fast is that for me, the power of the collective is being able to recognize how we all contribute in different ways. And like Madam said, whether from the private sector, whether from the public, whether you're a research think tank, all these different collectives, everybody's contributing to make sure that um, we can work together to deliver better results or impact. I always be a lot of collaboration, strategic partnerships to be able to deliver results. So with the Amuje, what this has done again is expanded my personal network for me in terms of meeting other women, other sisters in different, a lot of us are in public sector, but there are quite a number in civil society, some in private. And the idea is 
being able to um, have that network access it helps a lot because um, that helps with um, amplifying the work we do at the Employment Trust Fund. It also helps with connecting us to the right people that we need to know. Um, the center has done a lot of that for me personally. I think um, for me, again, it's also that the workshops, um, the engagement, the going back to my sisters to um, ask an opinion about what I'm going through or what they think I should do better. Um, all of that feedback and workshopping has been very beneficial to me personally. And in, you know, more, more importantly, in delivering results, because when I think about the doors it has opened to additional financial um, opportunities um, for the Employment Trust Fund, it has been very useful and helpful. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you, Teju. Um, and I think that's an important link. So going back to that representation comment, it's not just representation that this community, this network will help you, um, you know, sort of as a woman leader, but it's actually furthering your work, the connections that it brings, the advice, the, the feedback, the experience, the pitfalls is going to bring, you know, more to your work, which is going to lead to more jobs, more sustainability in, in the development uh, and issues issues you're working on. So for me, that drawing that thread through is so important for our, our audience. Um, uh, Dr. Yakima Jones, I'll turn to you next. Um, you've talked a bit about um, uh, your both your personal work, your career, but also your foundation work, and also a little bit about maybe the importance of human capital. I think that's something that in our our pre-discussions, you all spoke about, you know, what is it about human capital development that you that comes through in the Amuje initiative and, and through the collective of sisterhood that you've um, benefited from? Hi, Kimberly, thank you. Um, I view the collective power that we have as women as like coming together to create and develop um, sustainable solutions to the issues that we're all facing in different spaces. And it's not just about us women that are leading is also how we can bring other women along. So regardless of age, race, that they all have something to share and contribute to driving this change. And in the Amuja initiative, what are, one of the biggest learnings I've come to, to get is how to choose a goal and stay the course. So as Madam says, like it's actually teaching us courage because um, seeing and learning from the sisters that have gone before me and uh, my current cohorts, like we all have challenges we wrangle with every single day and just having this platform and network to share and bounce ideas off and see how they overcome these challenges real time. And even those let them lessons from how they overcome past challenges. It's something that I continue to be happy about and learn from and grow with every single year throughout the initiative. And when we talk about human capital development, we know that us, the humans, are the biggest resource that the world has, and we should fully leverage what we have to offer. And us women making up more than 50% of the world's population, definitely, if we are not trying to find ways to fully leverage what women bring together to the same collectively, like self-sabotage. And when we talk about human capital development, it's not only um, education, health, agriculture, it's also having the first addressing the around um, skills development, advocacy, having access to safe spaces, governance, human rights, and all those things that kind of sometimes get lost in the main narrative, just bringing them to the forefront and letting others know and see that if this woman has done it, there's an opportunity, a chance for me to also do it because representation matters, like we always say, not just in terms of race and other issues, but if a girl sees somebody, a, a woman leading an organization, driving change, of course, drives that self-belief and confidence that there's power, this woman can do it, I can do it, and women collectively can do it. So it's not just adding voices, it's like initiating action, doing and motivating others to make sure that they're empowered and can believe that they can help that transformation every single time. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, Ole, I'm going to turn to you because I know um, one of the big things that you're doing through your work is, you know, maybe taking a few step backs and making sure that the architecture is in place. Again, it's not enough to say, 
women should be there or, you know, even the pathways for, for youth or, you know, young political leaders, we have to do the work to prepare. And that takes time. Uh, in my former world as a banker, we always had to do so much prep work before we ever got to the stage of launching something new and, and building up on, on top of that. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about the work that you do and also how the Amuje initiative sort of feeds into uh, the success of that and what, you, what you've learned from that in, de in developing the young people um, in your country. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Um, yes, and the work that... Um, we've been doing or what I have been doing um, over the past years has always been um, helping people to build, as I mentioned, on their personal and professional development. And um, that also triggered my setting up and establishing the GAIL, which is the GAM Africa Institute for Leadership. And the whole concept of that was to help people because there are certain, certain things that we've realized that are not taught in the classrooms. Um, um, the young women that I have mentored who are A students and are terrified to speak in public or to express themselves. There are um, women who are not able to, um, you know, who are academically bright but economically marginalized. There's some who are not able to speak in public. There's some who do not have opportunities um, like we have with the MEJ to link and to connect. So the, the whole concept was to help set up like um, debating societies, um, help um, the team or these youths do community development work, because the whole idea is to prepare them on the soft emotional life skills. Um, we are never prepared for life outside the classroom. And then when we get out, we, it, you know, it dawns on us that it's a completely different architecture or approach that we need to do. And that was the reason why the GAIL was set up. And um, similarly, this is what we're doing also with the um, United Democratic Party. Um, it dawned on us that as we progress in the party, there was a need to start building and developing future leaders. Um, just as the Amuja Initiative has um, provided opportunities for us, um, we decided that it was important that we start setting up, identifying youths from across the, the entire region, both male and female, and um, prepare them on public speaking, how to engage with the media, um, you know, um, how to work on uh, um, protecting themselves from cyberbullying, how to engage with communities, how to go out with the communities and sell themselves. And uh, it's been quite an experience for, for us, even for myself as an individual, um, coming back from the international development and coming home to engaging in politics. So I think um, for us, um, what I've learned in the Amuje initiative of um, having the sisters around us, I remember the first time we met, there was an instant trust. We just knew we were just, we could just talk about things we couldn't even talk at home with, with our husbands or with our siblings. And um, I remember just purging out and talking about um, what we were thinking of and dared not speak or say, um, made some of us emotional and we cried. We cried as a group, we hugged each other. You know, we were afraid to even say it. And the fact that it came out, um, amongst us as, as, as sisters um, was an eye-opener for me. And, and I, I, I felt I had that safe space to always reach out. And, and that has helped us in, you know, some of us as, as, as individuals looking for jobs, um, network, connections, just meeting each other, visiting when we're in each other's, you know, sharing ideas. It has been something that if it was not if it did not exist, if the Amucha initiative did not exist, it would have to be reinvented. For me, that is one simple way of talking about building women and building them together. Because we know that a phone call away, anyone within the Amuja network, and that has helped, you know, solidify and build our confidence as well. Thank you. Now uh, that um, everything you say makes complete and utter sense to me. I I also convene a community of women leaders globally in this sense, but at its core, it's a support system. Leadership can be a very lonely place. You are 
often in many different countries. And I think what's great about the Amuja Initiative is I think a lot of people think it's just future presidents. It's actually women across a uh, cross section of different um, uh, industries, civil society, NGOs, because that is the fabric that it takes to support and understand each other as well. You know, you can be, yes, president or finance minister, but you need to understand what's going on in the employment section or in the health or the challenges that NGOs are having. And so I think um, making sure that our listeners understand that you are a cross section of women um, and and maybe um, Teju, back to you. What you um, maybe what unexpectedly came out of joining this, you know, from when you first applied and were accepted to where you are now, your experience. You're a very high level um, woman leader. You know, you're CEO of um, the Employment Trust for Lagos. Uh, yet, you know, this safe space to hug your sisters, to yeah. learn, to cry, to celebrate, to have fun. Um, tell me a little, a little bit about that in your experience. I, maybe what it was if if, I just, when you started. If I, if I just add to what Ole says again, is that remember that there's no politics school one-on-one that you get to attend, whether you go to university and anybody's going to tell you how it was done when you get into the public space. But when you get into the Amuje, they literally have workshops for us. For example, we've had workshops for media, how to do media, how to storytell, how to help with, you know, writing your own documentary, controlling your narrative, you know. These are very useful things for people in public spaces and in the public eye. I, I, I find it that one of the most impactful things for me also has been that, um, you know, the days when, you know, it gets really lonely and in the public space, sometimes you really feel like throwing in the towel, like, but you go to your sisters and you have this good conversation. And this happened, you know, with the cohort too, or, you know, we have another politician too, but you just kind of feel like, you know what, this. I can go back into this ring and, you know, let's continue this fight because we need to stay at the table. More importantly, understanding your role, being in that space, your own example to the next um, woman who gets the opportunity. And this is so critical because, again, my other sisters have said this, you need to show it to the next woman. She needs to believe in herself. So you re remember all of that after having those conversations. And you come back and you're like, you know, this, we can do this and we will do this and we will continue to do this. Yeah. So that's been critical for me. And I just thought, you know, the experience has been very good, very, very good. Um, like you said, again, it's about amplifying um, the work we do at the Employment Trust Fund. It's critical because when you think about the World Bank saying what COVID did, you know, taking another 7 million Nigerians into poverty, Lagos employment um, numbers, uh, unemployment numbers dropped by over 15%. So the network, the access, the kind of funding we need to have the kind of dent, um, I'm very glad to say that at least we've, I've seen a lot of support from the Amuja Initiative in this regard. They've introduced me to coaches, to other funding um, opportunities for the Employment Trust Fund. Great, thank you, Teju. Um, uh, Yakima, I'm going to turn back to you. And I think there was something that you said that I'd like to have you maybe uh, amplify for the uh, audience. It's not being part of this initiative. So um, it's not, not who you know, it's who knows you. And what has the Amuje initiative brought in terms of uh, that comment that you made? Maybe explain that comment and, and how the Amuje <laughs> initiative um, ties into that. So um, I think a lot of my sisters will allude to this, like growing up, it's kind of some kind of a silent tradition in Africa that when some, if you've been, if things are going well for you or you've been successful, you don't need to like speak about it a lot. So like you should be a bit conservative around it. But then I got to realize that if I'm doing all what I'm doing in these different spaces and you see on a daily how huge the challenge is, how much work needs to be done, especially when usually like we report in development progress in terms of the target we've set for the SDGs and you're like, it's less than 10 years away. We're still um, dealing with shocks in the economy. Then there's this huge gap in health education. You're like, we really need more hands on deck. 
And so one of the things I learned in the initiative is about learning to amplify your work and tell your story and also navigating the space with all the challenges that it brings, the public service brings. So this is really the two anchors for me in the Amuche um, initiative, like amplifying our work, building the networks, having these um, sisters to just stand on their shoulders when things get tough or just to bounce ideas off on how you can approach things and building the networks. And just building the networks is not, for me, it's not just about connecting with people. It's also helping me in how I approach and problem solving, just having the systems lens on seeing how different things connect. So if you're working in agriculture, you try to see, oh, how would this link to nutrition outcomes for pregnant women? Or how would this link to addressing teenage pregnancy in education? So it's like seeing all the different chains and how different things are linked. Just how everything is connected to come together and collectively, that's how we can drive the change. So the, um, the Amuja Initiative has really helped me to hone that skill and how to always learn to reach out and know that there's a safe space to talk and there's somebody always there that's aligned, that's really out there, genuinely wants to see you succeed, that will provide the support that they can to help you in that way. And once you succeed, also learning to make sure you bring other women along, especially when you say it's lonely at the top. Definitely is also lonely at the bottom, but it's just knowing that for you to succeed, you need other people. And because if you are in economics, you definitely will need the teachers, you need the doctors, you need the activists, you need the, um, the traders. So everyone needs to be able to do well in their various places and need. Because I always say, when we all do well, we enjoy more. <laughs> I mean, just, just uh, if you could just adjust your microphone, we're getting a little bit of um, of noise from it just rubbing on your on your dress. Thank you. Um, I want to maybe turn back Ole to you and and maybe take it back to the Fragility Forum for a second. Um, now that people have a good understanding of the Emuja Initiative and what it brings, and get back to this issue of not just representation but the link to fragility, to policy, to you know the gender lens that women bring, you know. Uh, the, the different way, yes, you know, men network, we all know that, but, you know, what what this brings in terms of the policy outcomes and keeping the de development issues uh, initiatives going. And for female philanthropists like myself and other business leaders, you know, how uh, having women in these positions and how the Amuja Initiative is ensuring that the policy and the, the sustainability of, of whether it be employment or health or education um, requires this uh, level of women's leadership beyond representation. Ole? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, Kimberly. Um, I think, uh, you see, when we, when we look at women's issues, and I, I think COVID has been an eye-opener for a lot of us globally, and not just across the African continent. And, and we were forced, whether we like it or not, to adjust to a new normal. And we have seen countries in which, um, you know, with COVID coming and talking about the fragility, I mean, in this case, it's not war, but we have seen countries where women led and how they prioritized putting human beings first, um, making sure that healthcare was priority, making sure that um, they looked at a new way of how education um, would would spread out. Um, and I'm not saying that all men do that or all women do the opposite. Um, as women, mostly, naturally, as nurturers, we focus on, you know, what helps to lift our children up, what, you know, what helps to give them good uh, quality of life or health or whatever. And, and that really did come out um, and, and it was not a competition. COVID, you know, COVID knows no boundaries, but that really did come out strong um, in terms of the countries that were led by women and what they had to put forward to make sure that their, their citizens were protected at, against all costs, um, which is different from, you know, if you look at the other side of the coin where you had some countries were like, but we needed to, focus on the economy. We need to protect the economy. So it was a chicken and egg situation where it was, is it the human beings? Is it the people? Or is it the economy? Is it the health system? Or is it, you know, 
get the army out and make sure we have the defense system in place. So that I think was an eye opener. And um, I think naturally in times of crisis, women go out, they're usually the best mediators. They're the ones that are used to go and negotiate. I remember in my previous life when I was working as the executive director for Farm Africa Solidarity, when we had to do a lot of solidarity missions, going to countries um, that um, had um, struggled from conflict, countries like Sierra Leone, Liberia, um, Democratic Republic of Congo, bringing together women as part of the Gender is My Agenda campaign movement on the margins of the African Union Summit uh, to make sure that the voices of women came out. And these women talked about nothing else but human capital. All they were talking about was health, education, you know, uh, violence against women, children, men, um, you know, conflict, um, you know, just anything that would help um, improve the dignity of their lives. And that was what, what, that was what they focused on. And I, I think it is, it's been a lesson for us as women, just thinking about that. And like I said, coming back, I'm not saying all women do and all men don't, but what I'm saying is, the first instinct of a woman as a nurturer will be putting, um, putting the human being first in most cases. And this is what I think we need to invest in that because that empathy, that um, compassion that comes from within is something you can't explain. You, it, you know, there's, as, as, as was said, there's no magic bullet. There's no um, right or wrong, but there is, there's something that comes from here when you engage with people who you feel are deprived or are marginalized. I, I just want to give a quick example of when I went on tour during our campaign period. And I remember some communities that we went to and one of these communities that actually stood out where this woman had a bucket of water and said that water was going to be used and rationed for a whole week. And it was only on Fridays when the husband had to go to the mosque that they, you would use that water for the whole family. And I couldn't for the life of me imagine in the year 2022, how we can as countries not have access to water, just the basics. And, and I, I got emotional and I cried. And I remember one of my colleagues on the tour said to me, you can't be a politician. And I, I said, why? And he said, because every community we go to or every village that we go to and you see um, the, the, the effect of poverty and how it has affected families, you cry. So it, 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 that was a quick, you know, it was a, a wake up call for me thinking, does that mean as politicians, we are not supposed to have emotions or compassion or sentiments? So it was a wake up call for me, but I think bringing women together as a collective I think there is no better magic bullet than what we have in this Amuja. And imagine that amplifying. By the time we get to the third, fourth cohort, um, Africa would be, we will be talking about something else. And, and uh, you know, we are going to smash those glass ceilings <laughs> and not just break them, but smash them. And we are going to prepare future leaders to make sure that they are prepared, whether they want to be ambassadors or philanthropists or presidents or lawyers or whatever, but in their own rights as individuals, um, it is something that we have to do as a collective, uh, as human beings, naturally. Thank you. Timberly, I I'm love jumping. I, go ahead, Tejo. I'm just conscious just uh, that we have 10 minutes, so go ahead, make your, um, make your, um, your remark. Very quickly. Thank you. is I was just going to add to what um, Ole just said um, about, you know, so we too found, well, part, and I'm sure this is no longer um, research or an exam question. So when we did our impact, we found out that obviously the women businesses we were supporting had more impact across their communities, much more and faster than the men. We, we ended up launching a specific fund again to support women businesses so that we could increase that impact. The second thing we found out was we started to support the education and create a special program for the education um, in the sector. And they asked me, is this another way of supporting more women businesses? And I looked and I you know, stepped back to say, what really did you mean? And then they said to me, oh, don't you realize that over 95% of the founders and owners of schools 
when Ole spoke to the fact that, you know, women are just naturally nurturers. They're more concerned about human capacity development and they just have more impact. So I was just saying that, you know, there's, there's clear demonstration that, you know, funding and supporting investing in women is critical to be able to address all those development issues that we see across private, private states. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to get to this because this is the, the title of the session that I that I chose on purpose because as an investor, as a philanthropist, it's clear to me that we need to invest in women. We know this from your own work, you know, that, that female founded businesses do very well. I was on a panel earlier today about, you know, how we need more VC capital going into female founded businesses because it makes good sense. Yet we, I don't think we focused enough attention on you um, as women leaders investing. And that's what I want to talk about now, you know, the importance of investing in programs like the Emuja Initiative. So you can have not just two or three or five cohorts, you can have hundreds of cohorts because we can accelerate progress. We can share the learnings. We can broaden the collective, the sisterhood and move that much faster and bring that many different perspectives to the table. And also to show through uh, the power of numbers that maybe politicians, you know, maybe male politicians don't get emotional and cry for the most part, but it's okay as a female politician to get emotional and cry. Then maybe that's just part of it. And that's the empathy that you bring and that's showing another perspective. And it's not to say that a male perspective should be pushed aside and we replace it with this. It's that we need both of those perspectives, all of those perspectives at the table. So I want to talk a little bit now about investing in unapologetically in you and your fellow sisters um, as uh, as development actors, as philanthropists, that this to me is the first step and it's leverageable. If we get this right, if we make this investment now, it will pay dividends for years to come, both for you, for you as it should as women leaders, but for all of the causes that we care about. And I want to put that out there loud and clear, unapologetically, that I'm looking for action on not just broadcasting about your amazing work in this program, but funding this work, keeping it funded and expanding it and sharing this model you know, beyond Africa. Um, I think that what Madam has built here is absolutely imperative and I'll do everything I can to bring, um, bring this to light and to showcase not just you as individuals, but the power of the collective. And Yakima, I wanted to turn back to you because you're a philanthropist as well. You, know, you take this on in addition to your, your work um, which I think is the other thing that um, perhaps as women leaders, we we do have this portfolio approach. It's not this or that. You see something in your, maybe in your work and then in your personal life, you find a way to sort of make room for that. And I, and, and particularly with philanthropy, I think there's um, this old model, which is like you, you have your career and at the end of your career, you sort of focus on philanthropy or doing something as opposed to models like yours, where you're actively doing both um, and you're bringing your voice you know, to your foundation, learning from that and, and tipping that back into, I'm sure, your work as well. So maybe a comment on that, of, of the multiple hats that you wear and how that can be shared with your, your sisters as well. Um, thank you, Kimberly. So I always like to say I have a portfolio career because um, just driving change requires you not doing the bare minimum. You really need to do extra. And you can serve in more than one way, of course. <laughs> Women, we're good at multitasking. So that's what I do. Um, being an economist, I support uh, my main heart wearing and um, being director of research at Ministry of Finance, driving evidence for policymaking and also bring, contributing to knowledge in that space and also bringing other economists along by lecturing in the university. But then in my work over the years, I've come to realize that the foundation, the fabric that um, is the foundation for all learning, which is reading, is kind of getting weaker and weaker, especially when I came back from studying. So I decided to find um, form the Yak Jones Foundation. And foundation is focused on bringing back the reading culture to Sierra Leone and driving literacy. And when we talk about bringing back driving cultural change, of course, it's addressing the fundamentals, going back to basics. And that's where we work, especially with young children, um, early childhood development and children in primary school, even though we support um, higher learning institution with books. And it's not just putting the books in their hands, but also providing reading, coaching and training their teachers to help them to engage with those books. So not only, it's not about memorizing spellings, it's like driving comprehension, creativity, 
creativity, um, civics, so that they can be empowered to be the most productive citizens in the future. And how I work is not, it's not like I have a lot of funding. It's just working with like-minded women, young professionals that them donate their time or help with fundraising initiatives. So if you have a collective of women and like-minded people that are aligned on your goal and just as like my sisters are, definitely you will be able to serve in multiple ways and see how everything is linked and you can drive positive change. And philanthropy is something I think we should all consider. It's not that you need to be a millionaire to do that. You can donate your time. You can donate things you no longer you, um, need at um, used books. It's just interesting. And even other people seeing you donate and give time in this way can inspire them to be part of that change process. So I have a lot of young students, volunteer that we train to be reading coaches that do volunteer their time. And it's not just in education that um, we need these things. We're looking at how we can make our women and our girls more um, ready for the um workspace, so of course, digital skills, um, creative, um, public speaking, just knowing team building. So we all have experience in these different areas. So you can work around that to bring other people around. And, and I don't want us to discount the importance of value out of mentoring, coaching and sponsoring and just in being intentional about bringing more and more people along on this journey. Because like, so when you have more hands, the work just gets lighter and lighter. And if they see you doing it and then they can see the evidence of your success and the change you're driving to get everyone else aligned to that vision and getting them, getting that buy-in will be a lot easier. And that's just what I'm just doing on a daily. And it's not like it's easy, the challenges, but then I've signed up for the goal and I have the network and the support system to end my own personal conviction to stay the course. That's great. I, I love that example. And I love how you point out that it's not, and I think a lot of people think this, that, you know, you don't have to be a millionaire, contribute millions. Of course, that's great if some people can do that, some women can do that, but it's actually skills-based philanthropy, strategic philanthropy in my case is, is what I bring. I'm a banker by profession and I bring that skill set you know, a structured finance banker to bring people together to think about what collectively we can do more of, what we can leverage so that the, the smaller contributions, as you say, add up and can do more. And we're at three minutes. In fact, we're at less than three minutes. So I'm going to have to close us um, up on this. I wanted to say a couple of things and then get you each to sort of say a closing soundbite. Um, for me, uh, the power of the collective means working together. And even by us meeting through Madam, we've already started to broaden our networks. Um, Tejo and I have a call tomorrow to talk about something which um, has sparked how maybe my work and her work could accelerate progress in Nigeria. So it's just so powerful. And what Madam has created here is something that we can hold up. But even what Yakima has created is equally should be held up um, as, as equally important. And that fabric of networks is so important. And investing in these um, is going to create new solutions and particularly sustainable solutions in fragile and, and low income settings. I think a collective of influential, inspiring and accomplished global women leaders together can bring more focus and expertise and action to the toughest challenges facing women, children and young people, um, not just in fragile environments, but everywhere. If we can you know, mutually and purposely sit at the center of designing a system and catalyze new funding and philanthropic pathways and things we haven't even thought of yet. And I did pose this to you as women leaders in our pre-call. Have you all thought of doing something collectively together where you could really make an impact as your cohorts start to grow and, and mix and, and you have voice? I mean, of course, it's important to focus on your individual journeys, but at the same time, uh, we can do things together. So. Um, uh, as you, as we champion in our own causes, I think it's important that collectively we champion you and work together um, and provide you with our, our support, amplify what you do and contribute together to the global public good um, that public leadership is at the center of. Um, as Melinda Gates will say, if you're not, if you don't have government along with you, then things aren't sustainable. And so we need to invest in, in women leaders at the highest levels of public leadership, philanthropy and civil society. So we're at almost at time, um, just maybe a quick, um, uh, remark each of you in closing, um, very short, Teju. 
I'll just say that um, if you're looking for um, a credible platform to invest in Africa, you're looking for how to support governments, I think um, EJS Center is definitely an avenue to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yakima, can I go to you? Um, I just want to closing. say that women can drive um, local ownership of these global goals and definitely we must hold ourselves personally um, committed to driving change and actually moving beyond the hashtags every year. Thank you. Ole. Um, thank you, Kimberly. Um, I think um, for us, we need to, like we, we said earlier on, it's very lonely at the top. If we can get a collective to support us, lift those at the bottom and take them up as we are going up. Because whilst we are doing our struggle, sometimes you can't, you know, it's difficult to look down and be, be you know, beyond you or below you. Um, the support to make sure that we lift more women up cannot be more fundamental than now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I know as Madam was speaking, you were all smiling. I could see it. I mean, she is just amazing, and not only from her public life, but this legacy that she is building is so powerful and you all enjoy it so much. At, at its core, you have um, gathered a group of sisters that you will have for life and that you will continue to you know, add to your family um, and including our, our broader family that we can work together. So I just want to thank Madam Sirleaf um, from the bottom of my heart from, for starting this initiative, for introducing me to you. And I look forward to many, many, many more conversations, um, highlighting your work, exploring what we can all do together and to expanding importantly, the work of the EJS um, Center. This is so critical, it's so investable, it's so leverageable, and it's it's what's needed for progress um, and sustainability, and particularly in fragile context. So thank you to the World Bank Fragility Forum for providing this platform. Thank you for scheduling on International Women's Day as we requested, because this is our day. This is the day for all women. And you know, I look forward to, um, to exploring how we can bring your other sisters to the table and, and do more work together and talk about their work as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Madam. And thank you to the EJS Center. Hashtag Fragility Forum 2022. For those watching, please tweet this out. Please uh, repost, because this is a conversation everybody should hear. Thank you so much on behalf of Global Women Leaders Strategic Philanthropy. Thank you, ladies.